Welcome to the next Moto Champion Talk Show brought to you by Bridgestone. If you missed any of last week's show with Yamalub Westby Racing's Matthew Skultz, you can go back and watch it again at nextmotochampion.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss an episode again. The latest issue of Next Moto Champion Magazine is out featuring Jake Gagne and the Broster Honda Racing Team, the Instagram page, product spotlights, writer columns, and the fan favorite, the Umbrella Girl of the Month. You can download yours for free also at nextmotochampion.com. And now for the news. Around the world, don't forget that MotoGP will officially kick off this season with round one under the lights at Qatar March 26th and World Superbike will resume March 31st through April 2nd for the Pirelli Aragon round and round three for the series. Moving on, congratulations to Jared Meese for making history at the inaugural Daytona TT over the weekend. Meese took home a dominant Twins win for Indian, making him not only the first rider to win an American Flat Track Twins race, but also the first on an Indian for the newly rebranded series, and also the first time a rider has won a TT on a twin in almost 35 years. His teammate Brian Smith took second, and Kawasaki's Henry Wiles took third. This makes the count Indian one, Harley Davidson none. Congrats also to Dalton Gauthier for making history in the singles class after qualifying 45th and coming back to win the first ever Daytona TT American Flat Track singles race. Here are your point standings after round one of American Flat Track. Congratulations are also in order for the winner of the 76th running of the Daytona 200, Danny Eslick. After the 2016 winner, Michael Barnes took pole and a consistent battle between Barnes, Corey West and Danny Eslick took place until the TOBC Racing's Eslick went on to win in a classic last lap draft pass across the start finish. And we have him on today's show to tell us all about his third Daytona 200 victory. The number 13 Corey West was ultimately DQ'd for an air filter discrepancy, promoting Michael Barnes to second place and the 33 Kyle Wyman to third. With this pick, Corey said, they can take my result from me, but they can't take this feeling. Other riders in attendance were Jeff May, Caleb DeCarroll, Shane Arbone, Valentin DeBeast, our guest from the first show of the year, Mark Rhodes, and our regular columnist, Chuck Ivey. Fan favorite Patricia Fernandez was the only female to grid up, and she finished 21st overall. Here's your top 20 from the 76th running of the Daytona 200. Come one, come all, says Moto America in regards to the Dunlop preseason test coming up at Coda March 28th through 29th. 43 riders will be in attendance, including 23 from the Motul Superbike Pizzazz Superstock classes, and the best part is, it's free. More information can be found at MotoAmerica.com. And that's your dirt. For those of you that have a Harley Davidson, you know what it's like to walk in, try to fire up your motorcycle, only to get nothing. The first thing you're going to want to do is check and replace your crankshaft position sensor, aka one of the most important parts on your motorcycle. Eric Black and Twin Power have more for you in this week's Product Spotlight. If we wouldn't use it, we won't sell it. Welcome to Twin Power. The crankshaft position sensor is one of the most important parts of your motorcycle. When it goes bad, your bike isn't going anywhere. 100% tested to OEM specifications at 60,000 miles to ensure sensor longevity, our crankshaft position sensors won't leave you stuck on the side of the road. Plus, they have an exact OEM fit, form, and function due to our OEM-style connector with a unique coverage for Harley-Davidson. So how do you know when your crank sensor is bad? Well, it's simple. Your motorcycle will not run. Twin Power has come up with a solution to keep you on the road without draining your wallet. Plus, this is a part you could carry with you and even change on the side of the road if necessary. Not sure if that's the problem? Well, you can also determine a crankshaft sensor failure by using a scanalyzer tool. Now, replacing the crankshaft sensor is fairly easy. You'll just need a couple of tools and some elbow grease. Step one, remove the socket head or Allen screw holding the sensor in place. Step two, loosen the old crankshaft sensor from its position and gently remove it. 
Step three, replace with your new twin power crankshaft sensor after lubricating the O-ring with a bit of engine oil and then push into position. And step four, tighten the screw. Route the wires like the original and plug in or insert the pins into the original connector, depending on type. See, pretty easy. For specific replacement instructions, please see the Motorcycle Factory Service Manual or your certified mechanic. Twin Power's new sensors, part number 484897 and 484898, will replace the Harley Davidson 32707-01C and the 32798-00B OEM parts. Each of these will come in right around that $50 mark. If you need more information on this Twin Power product or other products like this one, please give us a call at 800-347-7070 or simply visit us at TwinPower-USA.com. Twin Power, by bikers, for bikers. All right, we'll be right back with our guest, TOBC Racing's Danny Eslick. Motorcycle. Great rates for great rides. And we're back in the segments brought to you by TAW Performance. He's done everything from win AMA Pro Championships to race X Games to Moto2, but his latest accomplishment was this past weekend when he rode his TOBC Racing Yamaha to victory at the 76th running of the Daytona 200, making him only the sixth rider in the race's history to win three times or more. Let's welcome back to the show our good friend Danny Eslick. Danny, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on again. I'm sitting down by the beach here in Daytona. I'm, uh... Just relaxing for a few days before we got to head up to Woodstock, Georgia for the American Flat Track uh, race there in Woodstock and riding the Harley Davidson of Staten Island XG750. Uh, the big news is taking the win, and how did you celebrate? Oh, it's uh, you know incredible to win the Daytona 200 again. I mean, I had my hands full with uh, Corey West and, and Michael Barnes and Valentin DeBeast were were all uh, big players in the in the race and. Yo, know, uh, to celebrate, we went out, the whole team went over to the Ale House and we had a big dinner and we watched Supercross and uh, uh, we carried the trophy into the Ale House like we owned the place and took over uh, took over a big portion of the, the Ale House across the street from uh, the, the Speedway there at Daytona. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, the TOB, you see, I call it the family, you know, it's, uh, we're all tight knit and there's a, it's, it's an awesome group of people. So, you know, it's, it was great to go out. We had a few beers and, uh, you know, just had a uh, chill evening and just, you know, reminisced on the moment. Let's see the Rolex. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Three times is the charm, Danny. Um, so let's talk about the race. Okay, for some it's a race of attrition, but for you, you said right out the gate, this was gonna be a 57 lap sprint race for you. Uh, and it was, so let's talk about the race for you. It was plagued with a few red flags, um, but for you, how was it overall, aside from the win? Yeah, that was definitely frustrating. <laughs> get your head in the game and race and then there's a red flag and you get you know half a lap in and there's another red flag and it you know really throws a curveball and and just your your mental state i guess i mean you're ready to go race and then you have a big break and you know a few minutes off and then they don't really know how long it'll take for the for the cleanup and you know it was definitely an unfortunate deal for uh for the riders involved i mean dustin apgar lost uh lost a couple toes in his crash and, and his bike burn up so you know very unfortunate incident for him and you know, nobody likes to see that happen, but once they finally got, uh, we got the green flag on that final restart, it seemed like everybody had their heads screwed on right, and, you know, there was only a couple cautions throughout the rest of the race, and, and it made it, uh, you know, made it exciting. There's nothing worse than having red flags in the middle of a long race like that. It really throws your strategy off, and, and for us, it was, you know, we knew it was going to be a race to those first pit stops, and going to shake a few guys, and and surprisingly, there was a few more guys there than I really thought there would be after that first pit stop. And 
you know, the, mm -hmm. my team did an amazing job in the pits. We really focused hard on the on pit stop practice. We signed up for a few of the Azra uh, races there, and and it showed in the pits. I mean, I think at one one of the stops, I had like a four second lead, and that was 100 percent due to to the awesome crew that I have in the pits that. You know, got me in, got me out. It's like I had to get off the bike, and I think we were the only team running a two-way radio. So I had to disconnect my radio, and then once they were done fueling, I had to connect it and get back on the bike. And it was all I could do to get the radio connected back on, and they're dropping the bike down off the stands and, you know, telling me to get on out of there. So it was uh, incredible stops by my team, and, you know, that makes my job a lot easier whenever I can be in the lead. And, yeah, Corey West and uh, Kyle Wyman both ran me down after one of the stops, but it's a lot easier to manage it in, from the lead than it is to have to chase those guys down. Right, and of course you're talking about Michelle Lindsay and your TOBC racing team, which we'll talk about uh, here shortly, but uh, you touched on Corey West a little bit. He was there, it was you and him, basically all weekend. It, it alternated between you and Corey and, and Michael Barnes, who ended up on pole all weekend in terms of being fastest. So we were hoping for a race like this, and it did come down to the checkered flag when you passed Corey uh, in a final uh, lap draft pass for the win. But I wanna ask you about Corey and that situation and your, get your perspective on it a little bit from, from a rider's point of view and how it was handled. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, disappointing. I mean, I think they're still in the process of trying to figure everything out. But, um, you know, it's, I guess the rules are the rules. But um, in the beginning, a month before the race, uh, Scott Harwell, our team manager, called uh, the CCS and tried to clarify some things up with about brake calipers. The rule book states that it's stock brake calipers which means stock brake calipers. And I guess there was about 20 people that had them, you know, machined or sanded or, you know, whatever the their story is. And, and because there were so many people, they just went ahead and allowed it and threw that out the window. So on that side of it was a little bit frustrating. And they obviously made the, the you know, made it pretty clear, I guess, about the air filter and the air box and, and all that nonsense. But, you know, I think they're being a little bit harsh on, uh, uh, on his whole deal, um, I hate it for him because you know I've, I grew up racing with Corey West. Me and him were good buddies, and uh, obviously tough competitors when we race each other. And so it was, you know, it was an absolute blast to get a battle with him. Uh, you know, there at the end of the race, whenever I seen him come, and it's like I look back and gave him the biggest thumbs up I've probably given anybody. And you know, we we had an absolute blast. It was good, clean racing. Um, me and him actually had a really big hit off the start, the very first uh, start of the race. About to, I, it was my fault. I, I made a bit of a turn too early into turn one, just trying to not get taken out. And, and about took both of us out. So that one was my bad. But you know, me and Corey have raced each other for uh, for a long, long time, and it's been good, clean, clean race in our whole careers. Right, and unfortunately for Corey West, he did get disqualified, but it is still up for review, I think. Um, but the results are final at this point. Um, so let's talk about the historical aspect of it then, Danny. You're one of six riders in the history of the race at this point who has won three or more times. Uh, one of your really good friends, Scott Russell, five-time Mr. Daytona. Uh, how does that feel to be one of these guys who at this point has notched not one, not two, but three, and there's very few of you? It's pretty amazing. I mean, the, the some of the names with that are, uh, you know, Matt Ladd and, and uh, uh, I don't remember who, Kenny Roberts. Um, you know, that's th those are some big names to be to be tied in the record books with for the Daytona 200. And it's, you know, it's an honor um, to be on that list. Uh, three three Daytona 200s. I, I never thought I would have got one, and now I'm sitting here with three race wins and four of these awesome Rolex watches and. You know, it's, uh, it's a heck of a feeling, you know. I think it really didn't set in until yesterday, and I actually went down to the hotel I was staying at. I had a little putting green, and I was down there, left my phone in the hotel room, and was putting around. I was like, man, this really did happen. And, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to sink in, and, you know, maybe it really even it hasn't sank in all the way yet, but it's, uh, it's an amazing feeling, and, you know, can't thank the TOBC team enough for sticking with me and, uh, you know, giving me the opportunities that they do, and, and being able to repay them with this win, uh, you know, means the world. And that fourth Rolex came from getting pole a few years ago. Danny, you're three for three in terms of in terms of starts and wins. Uh, all Correct. three start, Daytona 200 wins are starts. You have one, uh, and they came on three different bikes: a Triumph, a Suzuki, and a Yamaha. So just making huge strides there, making a big big impression for yourself in the Daytona 200 history. Um, but let's move forward. 
to 2017. Congratulations on your win, and this is a great way to start your 2017 season. Back with TOBC Racing again, you thanked team owner Michelle Lindsay for sticking with you. Uh, so elaborate on that a little bit, and let me know what that what that means to you. That kind of commitment means to you. Oh, it's you know it's amazing. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people could have thrown me to the to the wayside last year after you know all the all the stuff that happened and. Uh, you know, it was just an unfortunate situation and, you know, bettered myself from that and, you know, we move on. That's, that's what we do. That's, you know, you, you can either roll around in the mud or you can pick yourself up and, uh, and, and keep on moving forward. And, and that's what we've done. And, you know, as we came out after the whole deal and when we got the Moto America season started, we got a race win there at, uh, Virginia at the beginning of the season. And, you know, we had a little bit of a rough go. Um, through the middle of the season and had another strong finish at Laguna Seca with the win that I ended up getting docked a couple positions for passing under a yellow, which, you know, was what it was. It sucks. I mean, I still have the first place trophy in my eyes. So, uh, you know, like, like Corey said, they might be able to take the first money and take the, take his second place away, but they can't take away that feeling of uh, winning or, or racing for the win. Absolutely not. Uh, so then let me ask you, any any big changes for you personally from last year to this year in terms of maybe preparation, in terms of your mental state, or just the way you're going to approach the season in general? Oh, big time. I mean, la into last year, I got pretty fat. I was almost 200 pounds uh, towards the end of last <laughs> year. I was up to uh, like 196 pounds. And uh, when I weighed in before Daytona, I was down to 164 pounds. So I lost you know, 30, 30 pounds over the winter time. And you know, basically just eating a little better and riding. Um, I've got all my dirt bikes going that have been beat up and blown up and flogged on for the last 10 years from, uh, you know, from my former sponsors. And, you know, I got them all out of the garage and dusted off and, and I've been wearing them out again. And it's just been riding, doing, you know, trail riding, riding flat track, um, a little bit of motocross and doing some track days at home. And it's, to me, it's, I'm not a big gym goer. I'm not a big fan of lifting weights or going to the gym but you know there's no no better way of training than being out riding the motorcycle well we know you're notorious for not training uh i i hate to put it that way but it's always been your approach to just go i just show up i race you're one of the most naturally talented racers we have in our paddock and that's with little to no extra effort uh, outside of the racetrack but it is nice to see that you're doing this for your sponsors and really showing them um reciprocity in terms of commitment from you um you've already taken on the 200 which is an expense in itself danny you have a full ride again this season for moto america also in flat track, you have an abbreviated schedule, but you have a full ride there too. Talk about at this stage in your career, most riders don't have this much going on, but you do even after everything you said you've been through, people sticking beside you. Talk about that for 2017 and having this much going on for yourself. I mean, for me, it's, uh, you know, 10 races isn't very many races. And, you know, that's all the Moto America season is, is 10 weekends. And, you know, there's, uh, it's easy to get sidetracked, I guess, when you only have 10 weekends that you're going to going to race. And so for me, you know, I love racing flat track. I love all the fans and the, the competitors, all the people that are involved with the flat track community are, are, are an absolute blast to be around. So for me, I want to be out racing motorcycles, whether it be the you know Moto America season or if it's American flat track or if it's a local cross country woods race at home. I mean, if I have an off weekend, I'm going to be somewhere to ride my motorcycle. Good for you. Um, so then let me ask you, fourth place overall in Superstock uh, 1000 last season, what's the goal this year? Obviously to win. I mean, that was the goal last year. We had, uh, I'd say last year was one of my worst years for finishes. I mean, we had a couple of DNFs from mechanicals and some other things, but I mean, a lot of it was just my own mess ups. I was overriding the motorcycle and I crashed. I crashed out of more races last year than I have out of my whole career, which is kind of hard to believe maybe you know, in the beginning, I was always labeled a crasher, which, you know, I didn't really crash out of races, but I crashed in practice or qualifying or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, it's uh, when you're pushing to the limit on, on everything that you have on the line on a motorcycle, it's, you know, it's bound to happen. I mean, you look at the, the Moto GP and Moto 2, Moto 3 riders, look at how many crashes they have over the course of the year. And it's kind of mind boggling that, you know, some of those guys crash three and four times a weekend, you know, and, and for me last year, you know, I, I made some mistakes. I crashed out of races and, uh, you know, I hate that. There's nothing worse than getting a DNF because of your own fault and, and crashing, you know, it's, it, it costs the team money. It costs me money. And, 
and you know, the only thing it's good for is the fans. <laughs> <laughs> right, and fortunately you were able to walk away from all those. You did salvage fourth place overall. Um, so Danny, we obviously just want to get you on, congratulate you on your third Daytona 200. Uh, wish you the best of luck for the 2017 season. We're happy to see you're back on board with TOBC, which is a great program, very professional, and they're uh, a welcome addition in the last few years to the paddock with their presence. Um, Danny Eslick's a good friend of ours. Danny, I got one more question for you. You've got a few nicknames. Slick being one of them, Wild One being another one. Which one would you say you're at at this stage in your uh, career? I'm going to go with Dan Tona. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome, Dan Tona. That's a new one. I'll have to call him Danny Dan Tona as Slick from now on. Uh, what would you say you're being more, is more in your character at this point? Slick I mean, or the uh, Wild yeah, One? The, I, I like the Slick. I mean, everybody, you know, the, the, the Wild One on the motorcycle and, uh, you know, the way I ride, I mean, I, I leave it all on the racetrack. I never I never leave anything out whenever I'm on the motorcycle. It's, uh, you know, 100% throttle or not. So, you know, it's uh, it's a little bit of a mix. It's trying to find that happy medium between the two and, and make sure I'm still having fun while I'm doing it. I love it. Slick, Wild One, Dantona, all three are very, very well, well suited for you, Danny. Well, best of luck this season. We want to get you on uh, before you lost that big buzz, which I think it'll be a while. We want to get you on fresh off of your third Daytona 200 win. And we look forward to seeing you this coming weekend in Woodstock for round two of American Flat Track. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course. And we'll be right back after this commercial break. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Woodcraft-CFM.com is your made-in-the-USA aftermarket parts specialist when it comes to rear sets, clip-ons, sliders, engine covers, and more. Woodcraft is the exclusive distributor of brands like Armor Bodies, Cycle Mount, and new for 2016, Hindle Exhaust, a combination of power, quality, and value that you won't find anywhere else. Find them all at Woodcraft-CFM.com. <laughs> It's time for a little segment we like to call the Next Moto Champion Moto Minute, where we get you up to speed on the latest and greatest motorcycles on the market in a minute. Today we're looking at the 2017 MV Agusta F4RC. Let me warn you, this motorcycle will break the bank, but it may be totally worth it and here's why. MV Agusta says this bike is a result of meticulous and continuous evolution applied to every last detail. In direct connection to World Superbike Racing results, you'll find the same technical pedigree of the Reparto Corsa F4 ridden today in the World Superbike Series. So in more detail, MV Agusta says the F4 RC has the most comprehensive package amongst hypersports. Starting with the engine, this is an inline four-cylinder that's been enhanced with a central distribution chain and radial valve layout for the equivalent of 205 horsepower maximum power in road configuration. The racing kit will increase the performance to 212 horsepower. The SC Project Titanium single exit exhaust system has been developed with the racing ECU. The undertail piece exhaust shroud is manufactured in carbon fiber to aid in heat transmission with minimal weight. The single seat tail unit lightens the bike and aesthetically aligns with the racing vocation. The chassis is a TIG welted trellis with CRMO steel tubes for peak performance. The aluminum alloy plates close the rear frame and form the fulcrum for the single arm with the option for height customization. The braking system matches the performance with a pair of 320 millimeter diameter discs with steel braking areas and Brembo's GP4 piston radial calipers and the Olin's forks and shocks with piggyback reservoir complete this racing package. The finishing touches are in the number 37 embellished on the fairing as a reminder of the world titles won by MV Agusta. It comes with a wooden box filled with high quality components, a protective bike cover, and a certificate of authentication, along with a price tag of $46,000. For more information or to find a dealer near you, visit MVAgusta.com. And that's this week's Moto Minute. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks so much for tuning in, and thanks to our guest and good friend Danny Eslick for calling in. We'll have more for you all season, including your favorite racers, fast products, Moto America, and American flat track coverage. Don't forget to join the over 10,000 others and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on dailymotion.com. Join our newsletter and get this show and more straight to your inbox each Friday. We look forward to a great season with you and for the future of motorcycle racing, it's here at Next Moto Champion. Holy shans.